Right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us on this lovely sunny day as our first uh, Zoom Q&A for our virtual garden festival. I'm Louisa Carpenter. I'm the visitor experience manager here at Chawton House, currently in a dark room, but only because I'll get a very bright light behind me otherwise. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the garden tour, which was filmed very recently in our gardens. Um, and there's a sort of slight taster, so if you can't come here for real, you'll have, you'll have a little wander around the gardens with our lovely volunteer, Yvette. Um, so this is really a follow-up uh, question and answer session, so if you have any questions that you're burning to ask the team, please do. Um, with us today, we have Beth Scott, our garden volunteer. Beth, do you want to say hello and do a wave? Hi. <laughs> um, and Katie Childs, our chief executive. Hello. Uh, and also uh, Cleo O'Sullivan, who's our uh, marketing manager, and she and I are both going to kind of field the questions um, and make sure that it's running smoothly, hopefully. Um, so we've got 25 of you in today. Um, so the protocol is if you want to ask a question, you can either uh, type it in the chat function. So it works differently on different devices, but somewhere along the bottom of your screen, you'll have a chat uh, functions you can click on that um, or you can also go to participants and you can raise hand um, and if you raise your hand we will come to you we'll unmute you and you can ask a question that way as well so whichever you feel comfortable with um, go ahead and do that um, so before any questions come in which I don't think anyone's got there yet um, I will ask you Beth, you've been um, a volunteer here for a really quite a long time now haven't you and um, yeah. you as well as working in the house you work in the gardens uh, quite often and you, and you give garden tours um, and what's the what's the thing that you most enjoy about volunteering in the garden? Um, I, I think possibly the the actual history of the garden and also the nice thing is being outside and um, whether that's summer or autumn or spring, because you see so many changes in the garden and people are really interested in both the actual plants and also in the layout and the, the kind of history and how it fits in with the house. So um, I suppose that's it really. Yeah, and, it, and you're right, it really does change, as all gardens do change through the seasons, but what's been lovely recently, and. Um, equally sad that people haven't been able to enjoy it is that it's really suddenly bursting in into bloom so for the tour video we filmed a bit about a month ago but then went back and filmed last week for the roses and things like that because they're suddenly just amazingly beautiful they um, are and and they smell so lovely and the spring flowers have been amazing because we didn't cut the grass so much and and the yes. cow's lips have been lovely. Really. Yes, there's lots of wildflowers now, which is really lovely for all the, the bees that are sort of buzzing. You hear them, it's really loud. It's always louder than the road, which is nice <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, so someone has asked a question. So uh, there's a question on the chat from Caroline Rollings. And I, I don't know if this is like typo, so I can't quite read what she said, but it says, hi, I'm in the herbs. I think maybe interested in the herbs. Um, what are they and what did they do with them? So I think that's the Blackwell herb garden. That's probably a question for you, Beth. Um, possibly, yes. <laughs> um, certainly I can, I can sort of talk about Elizabeth Blackwell and also um, some of the herbs that were planted in the, in the first place. But I think that uh, Julia can probably talk much more about um, the future plans of the herb garden. But currently we, we've got the herb garden divided in four and there's a section on uh, herbs that can help complaints with the chest. Another one is uh, the skin and then there's digestion and um, problems with the head, sort of headaches and madness and all sorts of things. And probably the most interesting thing is not just the common herbs like that we've all got, the culinary herbs like uh, sage, thyme, um, rosemary, marjoram and so on. There are um, amazing things like wormwood, which was actually used at one time to help um, tuberculosis a form of tuberculosis that actually creates swollen glands in your neck. And um, I'm not quite sure if it's still used, but I believe it is still used for Crohn's disease as well. So 
So there are all sorts of things, or maybe that's hemlock. I might be getting confused there because hemlock's another one that I don't think any of us would would take now. So, um, you know, fashions change and also they find out whether things are poisonous or not. So I'm sure Julia can add some more about what is there and maybe in the future. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Julia, I'm the gardener. Um, so I've been assessing what's currently in the Elizabeth Blackwell Herb Garden. And yes, there are quite a few herbs that are very contemporary to uh, what we would expect to see now. Um, the herbs that were originally um, illustrated by Elizabeth Blackwell, we maybe wouldn't consider to be herbs these days, such as peonies and dandelions. Um, the dandelions, obviously, a bit of a, a nuisance in the garden, so you really wouldn't want to cultivate them. Um, so I do have a project um, over the next couple of years to just look at what's in the herb garden, try and make it a little bit more relevant to the history um, as to, opposed to what you would expect to see today. Um, and to again look at the different types of herbs and what their functionality would have been. Um, and at that time it was probably, some of it, some of it would be a little bit risky um, today perhaps to use um, as a cough medicine or something that you ingest. And we, we do have to put warnings out obviously if we put certain herbs in the garden. So um, there's a little bit of work to do around that, but it, it's definitely a very interesting subject. And on that, Corinne Young has put a, uh, on the chat um, that she's studied the Blackwell book and thinks it's beautiful. Um, but she'd love to know if there is a plant list for the garden. I think, Julia, you do have one, so we could possibly share that. Yes, I do. I do have um, an identification list. I have the original planting list from 2016, which I'm just going through now to check whether that's still right. Um, so, yes, I, I do have a list which I'm going through. So, Corinne, if you, if you did want that, we could, um, if you email us at info at chortonhouse.org, we can share that with you. Um, but um, as Julia explained, we are sort of in, in process of making some changes, so it might well um, evolve. <laughs> um, so I have a question from Brenda here, um, and she says, I'm a writer who wants to write fiction set in Jane Austen's era. Is there a website or book you recommend that would tell me what garden plants, flowers and trees were popular in Austen's day? Um, I think possibly Katie will have some good thoughts about that, but you might as well, Julia. So if we start oh, with... Oh, if, if I'd known, I could have got oh. more props than are within my, my, <laughs> my reach. Um, because uh, in one of um, the other rooms, I'm in my, um, I'm in my flat in, uh, in London. And I'm looking quite jealously on at Julia being in the courtyards at Chorton House. Um, so uh, Kim Wilson's book, and actually Kim Wilson is speaking, um, she's at the end of the festival. Um, she, her book is all about Jane Austen and gardens, um, and that includes some, uh, some references to some of the plants that, that Jane Austen would have known. Um, there, uh, any look at kind of Regency roses, um, and uh, Peter Beale's nursery, um, they uh, have a, it's quite, it's a very old publication, it's just a 1970s, uh, 1970s publication, but it goes through the Regency Roses um, that Jane Austen might have known or might have, might have been familiar uh, with in, in her era. Um, and uh, there were, uh, around that period of time, um, there were quite a few sort of manuals for, for kind of understanding the botanical world. We have a, a few of them in our, in our collection, um, mostly aimed at, at children and, and being able to, to kind of explain the, the Linnaean system of, of botany and classification of botany. But they go through um, kind of what are popular and familiar plants um, at the time. Uh, they tend to be kind of meadow plants, um, aquilegia, um, what you see in, in kind of cowslip what you would see um, kind of naturally around um, around the kind of countryside um, although it was of course a changing era for kind of garden design and, and kind of garden fashion um, and I know Yvette in, in her tour talks about the kind of changing fashion and where um, Chorton House gardens were when whether or not they were fashionable at the time that, um, that Jane, Austen, uh, Jane Austen knew the gardens. Um, so yeah, probably what we would now consider kind of uh, kind of cottage garden or, or meadow uh, meadow plants were, were most likely 
um, to be to be ones with which uh, with which people were familiar in the Regency era. Is there anything you think I might have missed out there, Julia? Um, no, I think you covered it really well. I think um, just to add that from about 1750 onwards, there was quite a lot of uh, scientific work that was starting to be developed around identifying plants uh, genetically, well not genetically, but from their various characteristics. Um, so you start to see a lot more information uh, generally around which would apply to the Austin era. Um, but also the plant hunters were starting to migrate across Europe and into Asia and places like that and so would start to bring plants back as well. So you would perhaps start to see some more um, like a wider range of species but certainly around the Jane Austen time it was just as you said a lot of the, na the native British plants you would have seen in the gardens uh, definitely. Status plants as well don't you it's one of the reasons why a lot of country houses we, I don't think we do but have gunnera and uh, we yeah. also have Jerusalem artichokes because uh, yeah. once they're, they're not going anywhere um, so there are certain things that were social uh, signifier that you, you were able to import plants from. Uh, oh, slightly lost the connection uh, there. Area. Oh, there we go. Um, so Mrs Lyon on the chat is asking if any of Jane Austen's family come to visit um, the house that their ancestor called home and of course um, we are very familiar with some of Jane Austen's descendants <laughs> um, so uh, two of them particularly well so um, Richard Knight is the current freeholder direct descendant of Edward Austen Knight um, and he inherited the estate um, and was was really the person that we're, we're thankful to for being here because he's, he's the one that sought out Sandy Lerner as the initial um, funder and um, behind the project of Chawton House Library. Uh, he's still on our board of trustees and he visits very often. Um, his brother Jeremy Knight um, grew up in the building and then lived here again as an adult um, and he also volunteers here so he uh, he does tours and things and, and helps people around um, and his daughter Caroline who also grew up in the building um, actually gave a talk for us as part of our literary festival um, a few weeks ago so that's on our YouTube channel and can be can be watched still um, and that kind of gives a good over, overview of how it feels to be a, a descendant of Jane Austen and growing up in this building. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that. Of course Jane Austen, the Austen and the Knight families were both quite large um, so we're very lucky we have the, the direct descendants with Jeremy and Richard and the, and the families um, but yes there are there are others who have come to the house as well who are related to, to Edward in, um, in all sorts of different ways. He had 11 children did Ed, Ed, Edward Austin Knight so that is that's going to create quite a large family. Yeah lots of descendants and people who possibly don't even know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's another question from Rebecca H um, and she says there's a very established wisteria in the garden and I'm thinking about getting one for the first time in my garden uh, are there any tips for the first time wisteria growers? Probably one for you, Julia, I think. <laughs> I have to admit I'm not an expert uh, wisteria grower. Um, so I would only say what I would say about any plant is make sure that you get one from a reputable nursery. So make sure it's a good stock. Um, you can get different types of wisteria. So uh, there's a floribunda type um, and there's another one. So I can't remember the name at the moment. Um, but they have different types of flowers, so you could have purple flowers, white flowers, some of them are more abundant than others, so you can grow with really long racemes. Um, some are scented, more, more scented than others. Um, you need to look at the area that you're going to plant the wisteria into to look at whether it's the right size. Um, and the pruning of it is quite particular as well, so make sure you read up on the pruning. But yeah, generally, just make sure you've got a really good uh, quality plant and that where you're planting it is in the right location. They don't like it too shady, so make, make sure it's in a nice sunny spot um, and up a wall. Or you can train them as like um, a small tree um, as well. So, yeah. Can I just add something there? Um, I have a lovely wisteria in the garden and two other things. One is that it... It, it took an awful long time to become established and then it went crazy and um, 
also do protect them from frost because mine always gets frosted in the spring unless because you have frosts in may and the blooms are starting to come out and they always get frosted if i don't cover it with um, some fleece so uh, just a bit of advice yeah I, yeah I think i think that's down to aspect isn't it so yeah the sunny spot is something not on a north or east facing probably it's probably better on a south or west um, and a follow-up question um, from Caroline, she says, would you prune them in J June or July? So there's two times in the year that you prune them. You do prune them in July, and I think it's back to six buds, um, and taking all the long tendrils off because they can go a bit wayward unless you want to train them in along the wall. Um, and then you prune them again in January, and I believe that's back to three buds to get the flowers but double, double check that because I don't have my notes in front of me. So um, yeah, that, but basically those two times of year, you do need to prune them. Brilliant, thank you, Julia. Um, another question from um, Deborah Somerville asks, um, well, she's wondering really why the walled garden moved around so much. Um, something I've wondered myself because it, it does move quite substantially. Um, Beth, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I know that um, when it was down um, close to Gosport Road and opposite the rectory, that land didn't actually at that time belong to the <coughs> house and it was rented. And so I presume that's one reason. And another um, site was actually to the um, sort of the south of the church and quite close to the wilderness. Now, I don't know why it moved from there except that that perhaps being on a slope and at the bottom it's a bit wet i don't know and also perhaps by uh citing it where it is now um edward felt that it was closer to the house and better for um getting the vegetables and so on down to the house but i don't actually know any other reasons than that i'm afraid as often the way, sometimes we just have to speculate, don't we? Yes. <laughs> if they haven't written it down. <laughs> um, so I think we're almost uh, about to wrap up, but I just wanted to um, clarify because um, the first question, I hadn't quite read it pro uh, properly, but she's clarified for me. Um, so on the herb garden, um, it was that she was particularly interested in the herbs that were good for the skin. Um, so I don't know if you're able to just tell us a bit about those. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I can't remember what's in that bed at the moment, I'm afraid, but um, I know chamomile is, but <laughs> I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what's, uh, what's in that bed. I don't know if you can, Julia, can you? Yeah, I've, I've got the list here of the original planting plan for skin, um, and it says oregano, comfrey, oh, garrow. Um, which we all know is a killer now. Uh, lavender, which is quite an obvious one, I think. House leek, perhaps that's a little bit like um, oh, the, um, that one that you put on your skin when oh, you. Oh, like an aloe. Aloe, is it? Aloe, that's it, yeah. yeah. So maybe that's like that. Calendula, I've seen that in a skin product. Um, interestingly enough, I've got euphorbia here, which is like a real no no. <laughs> you would not put that anywhere near your skin. Um, soap works, um, and that's about it on the list that I've got here, which is again why I need to go through this because um, I just want to double check that everything is correct. Um, as far as the benefits of those, lavender is the one that is, I think, mm. obvious to everyone. We see lavender being used everywhere and possibly calendula, but I can't actually say that I've seen any of the others as a particular ingredient um, currently. Um, for skin and um, I can only say it must be like the soothing properties within within the plant um, and again with the herbs it can be various parts of the plant as well um, with the lavender we tend to think of the flowers for the scent um, and then the oil um, from the flowers as well that is used in various products um, so yeah so that, that's all I can say really about the skin aspect.
Brilliant. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I think we'll, we'll wrap up there, but actually we've got quite a lot more in the programme today about the Blackwell Herb, um, Herb Curious Herbal book, um, including our next uh, video, which is starting uh, just uh, shortly at one o'clock, and that is Amanda Edmiston, who's a storyteller. She's going to introduce Elizabeth Blackwell and her fascinating story, and you'll find out more about the herbs there as well. So um, I hope you continue to enjoy the programme, and we'll see you again, and continue to engage on Twitter, and keep an eye on our website for the new links for the rest of the programme. Thank you very much.